Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality and a happy new year, right, if we haven't seen each other before. So today we have yet another topic which is important in causality. It's a topic from Julia Pearl's book. It's uh, about algorithms that can also infer the causal structure just from data, but not for two variables. So those are methods that work if you have more than two variables. That's surprising maybe that if you have more than two variables that it's easier than if you have two variables. You have an idea why or what's, why is it useful to have more than two variables? Just for a reminder, for two variables, we looked at the scatter plots, right? And then we had some additive noise models or we had the, uh, some, the trace condition or some other criteria that were helpful to infer the cause and effect. So why could maybe more than two variables could be useful. Any ideas? No ideas. So the thing is, um, basically we were talking about this deseparation in graphs and the relationship to the independencies. And for two variables, there's only one independency that you can have. So the two variables could be independent or they are not independent and that's it. And so it can only help us to distinguish between the two graphs where we have each of the nodes without an edge and then some Markov equivalence class where there is an edge between the two nodes, but we don't know which direction. So that's something that we can decide for two nodes. However, if we have three nodes, or maybe I do this on the board. Um, so let me blank the screen. Okay, this works. So if we have two nodes, um, we could have A and B are independent, and that would lead to a very simple graph like this. No edges between them. Okay, or A and B are not independent, and then we will have some graph. So this is now a so-called P DAG, so partially directed acyclic graph, where I make an us uh, where undirected edge, and this is either A to B or it's B to A, or there might be some other hidden factor which kind of is implied. Uh, okay, so this is you should say the other way around. So those are three possibilities that are all behind such an undirected edge. Right? There is a relationship, and with Reichenbach's principle kind of we know it must be one of these. So by saying now let's do causal inference for two variables and looking at the independencies, it's super useless, right? I mean the the interesting thing is to distinguish between those two cases. And um, that there is a relationship or not, so that's kind of something, but it's not really inferring a causal direction or something. Now, if we have three edges, uh, three, three data points, no, not three data points, if we have three nodes, there are many more possibilities. And so we can distinguish more. So, for example, let's say we have <coughs> these three nodes, and we know that A and B is independent, and that's it. Those are all possible independencies in here, okay? Then basically it means there's not an edge between them directly, right, because they are independent. There must be an edge <coughs> between A and C and B and C. There must be also an edge. And furthermore, we know since we don't know that A, or we know that A and B given C is not independent, right? Since I said those are all independencies that I can measure, including the conditional one, we know <coughs> that this must be a weak structure. Okay, so in this case, I can orient all edges if I have three variables and I know only this independency is the case. Of course, there are other situations <coughs> where I know, um, let's say, let's take a different case. Let's say the <coughs> only independence that I know is A and B are independent given C. Again, in that case, I know there is no edge between A and B, and there must be an edge from A to C. And in this case, I, I have to leave it like that. I can only exclude the V structure, but there are now different possibilities. So it could be uh, this structure, it could be that structure, or the other way around. Yeah, so all these three possibilities are there. So we see that from 
conditional independencies like that, if I know that those are all that I can measure, yeah, I can uh, infer something about the graph. So this graph is already interesting. However, sometimes it's even super interesting and I really get the edges. Now you could imagine the more nodes I have, like the more interesting the set of independencies becomes. And so the more edges I can orient, okay? And the systematic way to do that is the IC algorithm that we look at today. And that's an older algorithm. I think it's from the 90s or something, or even older. So it's something that is well known already for a long time. So it's all before this work from the Tübingen and other people who were looking at two variables. So that was really super new, even though something like that existed before. Okay, let's look at it. And it's kind of tedious a little bit, and there are some yeah, it's, it's a lot talking about graphs and little orientations and blah, 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 and some sophisticated stuff. So let's look at it. So I'm following basically here this book from Julia Pearl, which I abbreviate now with Pearl. And basically, this is about chapter two. And I'm introducing all these notions from this chapter and trying to relate it to the notions that we know already from Jonas Peters, OK? It should enable you to look at the chapter yourself, basically, and understand what's in there. Yeah. So basically, I'm doing the translation for you, translating it in our framework, kind of. But it's just the same thing as before with different names. So he's introducing something like a causal structure and a causal model. And the short thing is the causal structure is the DAG, and the causal model is the structural causal model. So it's a combination of a DAG and some <coughs> parameters or probability distributions. And then there's observed and latent variables. So that just means, OK, observed are the ones that you can see, where you have data in your Excel sheet. And the latent ones are the ones that you know of, but you don't have data from them. So they are latent, OK? And then there's stability, which is basically the same as faithfulness. So we discuss it in a second. And um, these notions are important kind of to precisely talk about the IC algorithm. And then the IC algorithm assumes that all the nodes that we have, I also can observe them. So I only have observable nodes. Um, that's a simpler case, but already complicated enough, and sometimes doesn't lead to a final answer, like on the right-hand side. But some edges can be oriented, and you get the skeleton, so the undirected graph from the data. And then there's the IC star algorithm, which also allows some confounding variables. So there can be also some latent variables in there. And then there's the IC star algorithm. Of course, then the information that can be extracted from the data is an even less and even more unsure what you can get. So you can orient some of the edges. On some of the edges, you only know it might be this direction or there might be a confounder, but you cannot distinguish all the possibilities always. OK, so far so good. So we are following now Pearl's book, and the notions that he introduces are related or redundant with what we've seen already so far. So first thing is, um, this is the first definition in, in, in this Pearl section, a causal structure is a DAG, okay, where we have nodes V and edges E. And V is the set of random variables, typically. And then there's a causal model, which is a causal structure D, and then some parameters, where these parameters define how we can compute things along the graph. So the theta corresponds basically to these equations, to these deterministic functions in the structural causal model. So it's the same thing. We also assume that there are some noise variables, some random variables, and x, that have some distribution, which typically factorizes, like down here. So it says factorized, but this, should be a, this must be a product. So I need to change this one. It's not a summation. It's a product of um, all these marginal distributions. And, but basically, these parameters that tell us how to take the parents from the causal structure and use them as inputs together with the noise variables to generate basically the, the value x. So this is really a structural causal model. And again, the only source of randomness here are the noise variables. Yeah? So this is, uh, you could define it differently with having probability distributions or something in, like this. but it's nicer to split these two parts. So to have a deterministic part, which is like a computer program, and then to have a random part, which is like only some inputs. 
Um, the, in, the random part could be also seen like you have a random source somewhere where you can get random bits, and from that one then you can use the random bits to sample from any model that you have. So far so good, just different names for things that we know already, okay? Um, yes, as I said, those are just structural causal models. They're really exactly the same thing. Um, there's also this notion between semi-Markovian and Markovian models, and I introduced it already earlier, just for your pleasure here again. So the Markovian models are the ones where the noise variables, distribution of the noise variables factorized, where the noise variables are all independent. So that is like a special case, but one which is like at the starting point, it's a very good assumption. But then once you have some observations, typically the noise variables are also coupled, right? So sometimes they get dependent be between each other because they, they are all these V structures and maybe at the beginning noise variables are independent, but once you have some observations, noise variables get coupled with each other. And those are then called semi-Markovian, those models. So the starting point are often Markovian models, that's how the data is generated. And then you have some observations and you do some inference and then your in-between model becomes like semi-Markovian. For example, we needed that one for the counterfactual stuff where we condition on some data and then we run an intervention on it, okay? So there's the Markovian and semi-Markovian thing. So the Perl's causal model definition is about Markovian models, right? Because there was the assumption that the noise disturbances all factorize. And note that this is not really a restriction to the expressive power. Suppose you have this semi-Markovian model. So the U1 and U2 are not observed, right? So they, but there are some dependence between them already, and we know it. In principle, we could add more variables here. And by having more noise variables for each of those, we see that a semi-Markovian model can be in principle, by having more variables, always written also as a Markovian model, okay? However, some of the variables are just not observable, yeah? But I'm not sure if I would write a book on causality, I'm not sure how to do it. Maybe I would introduce these um, structural causal models and allow the noise distributions to be arbitrarily correlated with each other. I think that's more natural. And then you have operations between these models that kind of conditioning changes something and um, intervention will change something in this model. I think that might be a better way, but this is how it's done in the literature. Good, so far so good. Of course, um, having such a causal model will also induce a probability distribution on the variables as it did before for the structural causal models. So it's just a probability distribution that originates from applying these transformations F onto all these noise variables and onto the parents. And then there will be also probability distributions for those ones. So that's just the normal thing. And different notations, we could write sub m or sub d comma theta, yeah, but that is not really important. That is just different notations from different people. Um, then there's a distinction between observed variables and the other variables, and the other variables are just called latent. So they are not observed. For example, the random disturbances, they are never observed. But also the um, variables that might be observed can be split into the groups of observed variables and the ones that are not observed. And they are called latent or hidden variables. And this is also um, in latent variable modeling. I don't know whether you did you did latent variable models in machine learning or something. So for example, in um, the k-means algorithm, yeah, where you have um, a set of data points um, you know the k-means algorithm? Yeah. It can be also seen like a probabilistic model, and it is a latent variable model. Let me write it on the board, then you see what I mean. Um, so as a quick reminder, um, k-means is an algorithm, it's an unsupervised machine learning algorithm, okay? So your data is basically just a set of points, okay, and they could be whatever, from some vector space or something, okay? There are some points. On the board, we could drop some points here on the board, okay? So this is your data, so that would be for n equals to an example, okay? So that is the data. And k-means is a clustering algorithm, yeah? So at the end, ideally, we would identify, okay, there are three clusters here. 
and that is the description of the data. And then on each data cluster, we could also, if we wanted to, apply PCA or something. And maybe we get different answers for the different clusters. Uh, that would be a nice description. But the PCA step is not part of the k-mean step. The k-mean step is part of saying, OK, let's assume there are three means. OK, I, I know that there are three, so we were lucky to choose the right one. Then the k-means algorithm will find some cluster center, ideally mu1, mu2, and mu3, with some algorithm. And how does it work? Basically, at the beginning, you randomly assign these means to some of the data points, and then you assign the points that are closest by to each of their means, and then recalculate the mean. And then, again, look who's closest by, and so on and so forth. So that's the algorithm. Sometimes you're unlucky, and you might choose as a starting point uh, maybe that one and to two of those, right? Then at first, maybe the, this cluster will be split into two parts. And this cluster down here will also catch the, are catched by M2. But then maybe by calculating the mean again, maybe the mean two is moving towards the position over there, and then kind of it will settle. But it's not always working. So sometimes it can happen that the solution is not stable and you get something weird. So now where is here the latent variable model? The latent variable is basically the variable that tells you to which cluster are you belonging. Okay, so we have a random variable z, which is, uh, let's say, it's it's random. So it's um, um, what is it called? It's a discrete distribution. There are different names for it. Discrete distribution from the set zero, one, two. So to which cluster? Are you belonging in the micro probabilities for each of them? They must sum up to one. That is a random variable, and that is the latent variable, the one that we are not observing. And then we have x given z, yeah, is distributed according to a Gaussian distribution, where we say um, the mean depends on the z, and the standard deviation also depends on the z, or where we assume basically in the k-means algorithm, we assume that the standard deviations are all the same. So always the identity matrix. So we assume there is a latent variable z. And then given the latent variable z, we know that the x will come from a certain Gaussian distribution. And if you work all this out, you will get a density for that one, which will be the summation over the latent variable. So this is just the, pro the, the summation rule, right? I just summed out the latent variable. Um, however, if I have that one, I can now um, Okay, let's say here I'm having a P of Z defined. So those are the probabilities for the different classes. So I'm having a P of Z over all possibilities Z times the Gaussian distribution of the X, semicolon, and the mean Z and then identity matrix. And this is known also as a mixture distribution. So this is a mixture of Gaussian, okay, which you might have heard. And you can have it more generally also estimating these ones. So you could also have here some parameters that you could estimate. But in the plain vanilla k-means, you just have the identity matrix. And so the k-means algorithm is basically a latent variable algorithm, where you have a latent, you introduce a latent variable to what cluster are you belonging, and then given that you know in what cluster you are, the distribution is simple, and inference can be made. And then this EM procedure, expectation maximization thing, is basically always updating some probability distribution over the z given x, yeah, and then again updating the parameters of that one, which are the means, okay? So, and again, so the observable ones are in this case the x's, and the um, non-observable ones in this case are the z. And the k-means algorithm is an algorithm to infer the values of these latent ones, even. okay? So it's the same wording. If you want to learn more about this one, um, there's a very detailed lecture on this one, on Gaussian mixture models in the, in the PRML, Probabilistic Reasoning and Machine Learning lecture, also on YouTube, so you can also watch it there. Okay, so this latent is the same latent as we know from other areas, okay? Um, so now a latent, so we had defined what a causal structure is, and now we define what a latent structure is. A latent structure is a combination of a causal structure and then also some node, what are the observed variables, okay? So just a set O 
which tells us which are the observed nodes. So it's like a very mathematical way of writing things down. And you see that very often in the, in the book from Pearl, he likes to write these things down in such a mathematical manner. Um, okay, so far so good. Now, given a latent structure, we can ask what probability distributions can it express over the observable variables? Okay, and that is just defined as this curly P of L, which is the set of probability distributions yeah, that can be made for the observable ones. So here we don't care for the latent ones, but it might be relevant. So the latent structure might lead to certain distributions. For example, if my latent variable is something like this discrete distribution, like in the k-means example, yeah, then my set of probability distributions on the observable ones are the mixture models, these Gaussian mixture models in this case. Okay? So it's, it's all matching what is also happening in other areas of machine learning. So far, so good. Um, yeah, then there's, this, there's something that, that one can think of. So note that if we have an example of these distributions, yeah, for some latent structure, it implies that this distribution is Markov with respect to this causal structure yeah, for trivial reasons, by definition. Yeah? That's just constructed like that, that this is the case. Of course, when you wanted to show that, then you would have to show that there are, um, <coughs> or to show that it's Markov, yeah, then there were these um, different equivalent formulations of being Markovian with respect to something. Yeah? Okay. Next, stability, and this definition is only about stability, but I say already stability slash faithfulness because it's very much the same thing. Maybe to introduce it, let's recall what was faithfulness, okay? Faithfulness was this thing, um, so a distribution is faithful with respect to a DAG, yeah? If an independence in the distribution implies also some deseparation in the graph, yeah? So it's the backward direction of the thing that we always have. If we have a distribution and it's Markovian with respect to a graph and we have some deseparation in that graph, that implies a certain independence. However, faithfulness means that we also have the other way around. Okay? And another way to think about it or to define it is stability. And uh, that is defined as follows. First of all, um, Let's call the set of all independencies for distribution P like this curly I of P. Yeah? Where this, okay, you might ask, so what is an independency? Let's say an independency is a string A is independent of B given C. And you could put it into a string. And then this I of P is a set of strings, of these strings, right? So if you want to have very concrete objects. That's sometimes important when you want to implement this stuff. Then you need to think about a representation for an independency. You could also view an independency as a, as a triple of three things, of some variables A, of some variables B, and some variables C. So independencies could be also viewed as a triple, right? You see it once you implement it in Python or something, these kind of things. Okay, that's just notation. And now we say, um, suppose we are given a latent structure, then we say a distribution that is kind of coming from this latent structure is called stable, if and only if its set of independencies is minimal. That means if I have some other distribution from this latent structure, uh, this I of P is a subset of I of P prime, okay? Um, it's actually interesting to think, so, so there, there might be several minimal distributions, right? You know this in, in some partial orderings, there could be like several ones. But I think that can't be the case with this definition, right? Because if there would be two minimal elements, yeah, you can plug them here into each other and you could prove that they must have the same independencies that follows from this definition. But that's something that requires some deeper thinking. Uh, I don't know, I haven't thought about it, whether one can construct a graph where I would have two minimal elements with two independencies, sets that are disjoint or that are kind of not identical, okay? Would be interesting if we could find one. I guess we can't. But it's not trivial, right? It's not a trivial question. Okay, and it also gets another notation, yet another notation. So if you, then there's lots of notation, lots of wording. So if you get confused by it on one of the slides, just stop me and I, I, 
I probably also confuse and then we look back on the slides and see what was the definition. So for example, here's yet another notation, the set of stable distributions is P sub S, suggesting there are several stable distributions, okay? Okay, um, why could there be several? I mean, there could be several because we are talking about latent structures, right? Not about a latent model. In a latent structure, we are only talking about the DAGs, but the parameter theta could be changed and could be different. So for that reason, um, there could be different distributions in there, even though they have the same set of independencies. Okay, as I say, stability and faithfulness are basically equivalent. I'm formulating it slightly careful here, and I'm not saying they are equivalent, because there are some always some subtleties that I might also overlook. Um, okay, what did we want to see? Yes, okay, there are, there are these relationships between the deseparation criterion in the graph and the probabilities. So first of all, for any of my probabilities that are compatible with the graph structure, the deseparation in the DAG implies condition independence. So that is the trivial direction that we've seen before. Um, however, if I have a single distribution, then it's not always the case that an independency implies a deseparation. And the basic reason is that if I have a graph, I can always add edges, right? And adding edges only increases the set of compatible distributions. Until I have a fully connected graph, then basically all possible distributions are Markovian with respect to the fully connected graph. So for that reason, um, a condition independencies for some single distribution P does not always imply a deseparation in the DAG. Another example for this statement is, suppose the DAG are two nodes with one edge, then also the distributions where the random variables are independent is also Markovian with respect to that graph, right? However, this independence between the two random variables does not imply that in the graph there's no edge, right? That is the statement that you always can add edges. Um, however, if we have a for all quantification, so if there is some independence that holds for all of the distributions, then also the other way around holds. So if I'm having here for all quantify in front of it, then everything is fine. Now, curiously, if I have a stable distribution, yeah, in that case, I can also go backwards. Yeah. So the stable ones are kind of the one with the minimal independencies. And so those are the ones that are corresponding to the actual edges in the graph, right? In the graph, you can add edges as you like and increase the set of uh, possibilities. But um, in the, on the other hand, in the distribution world, you take the minimal element. And that is the one that is kind of the most characteristic of the graph. Um, Thus, for stable distributions, we have equivalence between the deseparationness in a graph and, the pro and, and this independence of the distributions, okay? The thing is, it is a little bit complicated, and the question is whether there is a better theory, but I haven't seen a better theory for this. So the curious thing of Judea Pearl with his Bayesian networks from the 90s and earlier is, or 80s even, um, that he found this interesting way of using graphs to represent probability distributions, but the relationship, even though it's very useful and making computation super efficient and having algorithms over graphs and something like that, so there's, it's still a bit cumbersome and a bit difficult, so since deseparation is not exactly the same as condition independence. Um, okay, as a repetition, so to make the relationship to faithfulness, so as uh, a reminder, we said faithfulness is exactly the case that we can have the other direction of the error. And then we had a notation with the curly I introduced a couple of slides ago. Then we had said that the L is some latent structure. That means basically it's a DAG and a set of variables. And we also defined some set of distributions that are Markovian with respect to such a latent structure. So those are the relevant definitions from previous slides. Um, oh, and we had a definition for stability, which very briefly express, says for all the other Markovian distributions, um, the P is the minimal, has a minimal set of independencies. Okay, and with all these things, one can prove that P is stable for some latent structure if and only if it is faithful with respect to our DAG, okay? So that is basically a statement. 
And it can be also proved here. So here's a proof sketch. So let's assume our distribution is stable. And let's take one independence from the subset of these things, uh, of these independencies of the P. Then the stability of our P implies that this independence must be also true for all other distributions in the set of compatible or Markovian distributions, okay? Since stability implies that the I of P is a subset of all of these, right? So if I have one from the set, it must be in all others. However, then it must be also true for the deseparation if it's for all distributions that are Markovian, right? Then it's also the other way around. So stability implies faithfulness. The other way around, suppose that P is faithful. Um, let's take another one. Now we want to prove stability. Um, and so basically we need to show that any independence from P, so for example A and B from the set, is also in the one from the, from the, from the pre-prime. So since P is faithful, this independence implies already deseparation. And since we have deseparation, it implies already independence for everyone else, okay? So that is the proof, basically, of faithfulness is equivalent to stability. Actually, I have to look up whether it's, um, maybe it's in the book where I got this proof from, so I should better put references on this where I have it from. Or whether I did it, did I invent it? No, I, I guess not. So this is all like worked out already for 20 years, I think, so this is not, not completely new stuff. So far, so good. So this is like, was a warm up and um, next we get to the algorithm, so the IC algorithm, okay? Um, most important question, what is IC standing for? I have no idea, actually. So I can make something up now, let's say inferring causality, okay? So that might be inference of causality, might be also the acronyms of the authors. Uh, I should look it up. So that's a question that just came to my mind. So the ultimate task, always is given data, recover the causal structure. That would be the best, right? But we know um, an easier task is, suppose we have the probability distribution given and then uncover the causal structure. So that's slightly different because here we only have data and we need to do another step, density estimation or something else. So the simpler task is that we assume, let's assume we know exactly the probability distribution. And then it's slightly simpler than having the data. But it becomes clear where I'm up to. The even easier task is, suppose I'm having a set of conditional independencies from my distribution, and then recover the causal structure. So we only talk about the even easier task, and that will be the IC algorithm. So we don't worry about how we get these conditional independencies from data. That's another practical problem. So there are different methods to calculate independencies. There are some statistical tests with varying powers, and there are also some machine learning methods. I think there's also the age thick method, and there's also a conditional age thick. So there are different methods that can calculate from data independencies. And they typically always have a turning knob, like some threshold, by saying, OK, if a certain number is below a certain threshold, I'm saying now they are independent or not. Because independency is some discrete property. It's either true or false. It's not gradually independent or not. It's either true or false. If it's only a little bit dependency between two variables, you must have an edge between them, right? Um, however, if you have finite amounts of data, kind of you will never exactly be able to prove independency between random variables, right? It could be just by chance that maybe your criterion that you're using is small, but with certain probability, there might be even a chance that they are dependent on each other. And so for that reason, in order not to worry about how to get from the data to the set of independencies, we consider the simpler task and say they are given and they are true, okay? And then it's already interesting to think about, okay, given the condition independence, how do we recover the causal structure and what can be said about it? And the other thing is a practical problem. Um, furthermore, our algorithm only recovers the mark of equivalent class of our causal structure. So some of the edges might not be oriented. Yeah? So if there's an actually structure like that, it could be also the other way around. But it won't be a V structure. Yeah? So it can be only one of these three. And then in more complicated graphs, there are many situations like that where we cannot orient edges. Um, 
Why, cannot, why can we not recover it? Because we're looking at conditional independencies and um, they don't give us enough information to orient edges. So also, having said that, we see that these other methods, the ones that take two variables and trying to infer something, they are really new and different from the older stuff. They're really using stronger assumptions, of course, and different criteria to find directions. So there's really some added value in there. Um, furthermore, to represent our DAG, we use the notion of a partial, partially DAG. I don't know whether it's called partial DAG or partially directed acyclic graph, so that also makes sense. So it's a partial DAG, a P DAG, where basically there are some edges are oriented and some edges are not oriented. Okay, and that will be the final answer. Um, okay, so here comes the algorithm, and then we go through it step by step and trying to understand why it kind of makes sense. So the input is a set of independence statement, and there's a typo, which I need. So I found two typos today already. That's good. And the output will be a PDAG. So step one, we first construct an undirected graph. So that's the skeleton of the nodes, OK? So when are we having an edge? If there are two nodes, A and B, they will have an edge if there's no set S that de-separates A and B. Okay, or with other words, that renders A and B conditionally independent. So no set such that A is independent of B given S and S A B. In that case, I have to draw an edge between two nodes. Otherwise, there might be other nodes in set S, A, and B, and they are along the connection between the two variables. But if there's no such set, then I can draw an edge between them. Note that S, A, and B could be the empty set, right? So um, let's look at it at an example. So suppose This is my true DAG. In this case, A and B are independent, given nothing. OK, so in this case, my separating set A and B is the empty set. OK? But there is a set, and the set is empty, so I don't draw an edge. OK? For the A and C, there is no such statement, and for B and C, there's also not, not any statement. And I think that's, again, already all there is in this case. So in the first step, in this case, I could create the undirected graph like that. OK. Let's see how we continue. So that's the first step. Now let's consider all non-adjacent nodes A and B. So what does non-adjacent mean? It means there is no edge between them. Yeah? For example, in the example on the board, it would be A and B. There is no edge between them. So they are non-adjacent in my undirected graph. Since they are non-adjacent, I know from step one there must be a set that separates them. And I gave it also a name. I called it SAB. Yeah? So there is a set SAB. And now I can ask the question, suppose A and B have a common neighbor. Yeah? So we have such a structure ACB. In that case, we check whether the C is in SAB. If it's not in SAB, I know there must be a V structure. If not, I know nothing. OK, let's get back to this example here. So in this case, I'm having the situation that there's a connection A, C, B, so they have a common neighbor. Oh, I need to switch. Thank you very much. So I have such a situation that A and B have a common neighbor, and now I can ask the question, OK, in the set S, A, B, is the C contained or not? It's not contained, so I can orient the edges, and I'm done. OK? Let's take another example. Um, something of it. 
So let's say we have A, C, B, but in this case now, um, for example like this, okay? In that case, I'm having um, A is independent of B given C, so that means that A is A, B, contains the C, okay? So, again, starting with um, A, B, and C, I know um, that A and C, there's no independence, so I need to draw an edge. B and C, I need to draw an edge. But A and B, there's some independence. So there exists a set to separate them. So I cannot draw an edge here, because in that case, the, the deseparation would be gone. So I know there shouldn't be an edge between A and B. That was step one. And now comes step two. A B and B have an adjacent neighbor C, okay? However, in this case, the C is contained in the set. So I cannot do anything. So I cannot orient further. And then this is the answer, the Markov equivalent class in this case, okay? So that's unfortunate. I'm stuck, but the algorithm is not wrong, which is also good. It doesn't tell us anything wrong. Okay, so that was step A, uh, step one and two. Now step three is orient the remaining edges without creating more V-structures and cycles. Okay, that is a very, uh, yeah, very difficult task to implement, I guess, right? I mean, there's another algorithm behind this one, right? Where you really have to go through all combinations and you need to systematize this one. Um, i show you the example in a second. There is some systematic way of doing it and it's shown on this slide, okay? And we go through it in a second and we try to understand it. And one can show, some guy, Meek, showed in 1995 that these rules are enough to do everything that is possible, okay? So again, some completeness and correctness proof, soundness and completeness. Yes? Um, there are some that we could know. There are some that we could, could orient further. I give you an example on the board, okay? Uh, okay, this is just a note that I already said, the set SAB might be empty. So I show you an example, or actually, uh, the example is on the next slide. I can also show you on the slide. So, suppose we know, as let's say there are four nodes, A, B, and C, and suppose we know A and B is independent, and um, that D and A, comma B is independent given C. So basically D and A is independent and D and B is independent given C, okay? In step one, we get all these edges here. So the edges that we don't get are between A and B because we have this independence given empty set, and we don't get an edge from A to D because D and A are independent given C, and we don't have an edge from B to D because D and B is also independent given C. So that's why we get the skeleton. That's the first step. The next step is we go through all of those, and in the latter case here from uh, D and A have a common neighbor C. However, the C is inside my separating set, so I cannot orient any of the edges B and D. I also cannot orient any of the edges A and D for the same reason. However, using this independence up here, A and B have a common neighbor C, and it's not in the separating set, so I know the edges must go like that. So step three is now I can orient the last edge as well, because if I would do it the other way around, I would generate new V-structures. And so in some situations now I can orient additional edges, and I should do that, right? I mean, it follows from the independencies, right? So if I, wouldn't, if I would put the error the other way around here, yeah, in that case, I would create more independencies. I would have created A is independent of, no, that is wrong. A is independent of D, and B is independent of D, given nothing. So yet another typo, okay? So Z must be D, and Z must be D, okay? So the key is to say, not just I have 
some of the independencies. Yeah, I'm happy, okay, I have some of them, let's see what I can do. The important thing here is those must be all of them. And there you see already also a problem of methods like this. Uh, let's say you have 100 nodes. In principle, you need to check all possible combinations and permutations. And so you take the first, whatever, A and B, conditioned on all possible subsets of 98 nodes and check for independency. Why is that so complicated? Because there are so many possible directed graphs with 100 nodes, right? So there are, I don't know, at some point I calculated them. Uh, but there are combinatorially many, so it's so many possibilities. And this is giving you only so little information. Yeah. Okay, so that is an example where you have additionally one. So what else was the step three? The other thing is without creating more V-structures and cycles. So sometimes it could, could be that you know um, some of the edges, uh, let's see, can I co construct an example out of that one? Um, uh, I'm not sure, but let's say there would be an edge like that and I have oriented already some, uh, or maybe there's another example, but let's say I, I know already those two edges from my independencies. I don't have an, have an example now up in my sleeve, but suppose I'm inferred this deck after step one and two, or then after did doing step three also a couple of times or something. And then I'm like this. And then it's also clear what this edge must be. It must be like that. Why is it not a problem? Why is it not a V structure? Because I'm having a connection over here, right? A V structure is only the one where you have a connection, where you don't have a connection between B and C directly, okay? So that's why the orientation um, with avoiding cycles is also sometimes useful. Okay, so far so good. Um, so that is the IC algorithm and the last rule is somewhat unclear how to do it systematically and how to implement it. But here's a bit more better rule. So we orient an edge A, B to A error B. If the other way around would create a V structure or a cycle. Yeah? Okay, this is already better implementable. Yeah, you could imagine um, iterating over all edges that you have so far that are not or oriented and then you kind of need to check for these things and you, but the problem is after you oriented one of the edges and again you have to go over all other edges and check. And I guess that's how the algorithms are working. So they, they have some combinatorial explosion in here. Um, there's also a way to write it more systematically. This is also copied from the book where I think I added the explanation. So Systematic rule three consists of four different possibilities. So let's go through them step by step and maybe draw some pictures. So we orient B, C to B, error C in the following situation. Let's see whether we can do it by in our head. So suppose we have an error A to B and then from B to C an undirected edge and A and C are non-adjacent. Okay, so that means there's no connection between them. In that case, we can orient B arrow C because otherwise we would generate a V structure. However, the V structures we should have found already earlier in step two. So if we are in step three, we shouldn't generate new V structures. Okay, so that is the first one. That was easy in our head. Let's take the next one. So here's another one, different letters. The rest is the same as before, but now comes the um, examples. So let's say we have a chain A, C to B and an edge from A to B. So it's one direct edge from A to B. In that case, we also know that we can orient A to B to avoid the cycle. Okay, so that's also a simple one. Um, next one. So this is a bit more complicated. So I think for that one, we need to draw an image. Otherwise, it's too tough. So um, how do we do this? Let me... Um, Copy it to the board, and then I switch. <clears throat> okay, we are at rule three, and we are talking about orient A, B to A, arrow B. 
So in what case are we doing it? Whenever one, there's a chain. A, C, B to this chain A, D, B and these ones to understand them just by reading it's not possible I think you really always have to draw a graph N, 3 C and B are non-adjacent Okay, and then the, the thing is, bracket to avoid following B structure, C, A, D. So let me double check because otherwise it's a waste of time to draw it. So A, B, blah, blah, A, C, B, A, D, B, C and D are non-adjacent, okay. And we want to avoid that B structure. Okay, so let's switch to the board. So let's work it out. So I want to show what, now what to do with this information. So how can you check it that it kind of makes sense? Okay, so let's draw a picture. So let's have A, and we have um, well whatever whatever the direction C and B. So those are the nodes. Okay, and we are talking about the edge A and B. So that is the one that we want to orient. So we want to add an error head over here. Yeah. Um, whenever there's a chain A, C, B, so there must be a connection from A to C, and then an error from C to B, and there's a chain from A to D, and a connection from that one to that one. Uh, okay, should we have drawn it in a different order here? Uh, let me think. I don't like this crossing one here. Uh, yes, we can move the D. Let's move the D up here. Blah, blah, blah. Just like this. Okay, so this looks nicer. Okay, and C and D are non adjacent. C and D are non adjacent, so there's no edge. So there are quite a few edges, and some of them are already oriented. Um, like for trivial reasons here, um, this does not introduce a B structure because there is a connection between B and A and A and C. So it's in principle possible to put an error head here, but um, let's try to reason. So C, A, and D. Ah, okay. I guess the problem here is we are the opposite. So what's happening if I put the error in the other direction? Okay, <coughs> so what does this imply? That implies that here we would get a cycle. So I know I'm having an incoming error from D to A. Similarly, here I would get a cycle, so I have an incoming error from that one. And now comes the third point. C and D are non-adjacent, so I'm having a V structure D, A, C. But you see the reasoning is like multi-step, right? So I'm assuming put the error the other way around, and this implies because of cycles certain other arrows, and then I'm having a V-structure between two of the variables here. Okay, so that is the reasoning. Are you all fine, or should I repeat it? Repeat. Okay, sure. So it is about asking, so we want to put an error head over here, yeah? And note, it doesn't create these structures because there are these connections, so in principle it should be possible. So, the way to do it is we say, let's assume the error head is going the other way around, okay? In that case, we have almost a cycle over here. So to avoid the cycle, this error head must also go to A. With the same reasoning, I'm getting an error head from C to A. And now I'm having a V structure D, A, C because there's no connection from C to B, okay? So it's quite complicated, and it's very hard to see just from the text. So you really need a picture. But I think I was too lazy to use ticks for this one. So far so good? Okay.
And ticks is super painful, as you know. Did you use it? Yeah. So once you have the graph and you make changes, that's nice. But to get the graph, that's hard. OK, next one. Here's another sophisticated one. You see also it's a multi-step one. So again, let me copy it to the board. So it's rule four. Orient A, B to A, error B. If there's a change, A, C, D. And there's a chain CDB, like this, CDB, and C and B are non-adjacent. And there's a fourth one, A and D are adjacent. Um, everything correct? C and B are non-adjacent. Okay. Again, what do we want? We want to avoid a V-structure. And which one do we want to avoid? We want to avoid the V-structure C, A, D. Okay? So far, so good. Everything copied correctly from the slide? Yes, I did. Okay. So now we are already better at drawing these graphs. So if they are non-adjacent, they should be far away. So we have B and C across the diagonal, and then there's A and D. OK, we are talking about A and B, and we are talking about this edge, uh, this error head over here. OK? So we have a chain A, C, D. So there's A, C, D with an error. And then there's a chain with more errors from C D to B, okay, we had that one already. Um, C and B, C and B are non-adjacent, A and D are adjacent, okay? So that is the situation. Um, now we do the same reasoning as before. Um, ah, which C, A, B, so we want to avoid this one. This should become a V structure. Okay, interesting. So, okay, let's try to derive this. I guess the reasoning again is that we need to add this wrong edge, and then we show that this will lead to a V structure if we do that. But this one looks more difficult to me. Hmm. Can you just derive it? What's that? Can you just derive it according to the rules? Did I did a. Um, ah, okay, fine. Oh, yeah, this makes it much better. Thank you. So I'm, I'm talking about that one, right? And let's assume we add an error head over here. Yeah? OK, that's already good. Because now this makes more sense, this um, B, A, C, D structure. And now from, let's say we add an error head here. Now we no need to show that we can't get a V structure there. Uh, OK, so let's say. We want to avoid, OK, it's about this one, and we assume we put one here to avoid cycles. Yeah? We don't want to have a cycle, so that would be a cycle here. We know that one must go to the other direction. OK, and here we go. Now B and C already have the V structure. Right? Well, it was a simple one. It wasn't too difficult. Everyone's fine? OK, now I can explain it quicker. So this is a setup, and we are wondering whether we should put an error head over here. Let's assume we put an error head at the other side. Then by avoiding cycles, we know that we have to put an error head at the A, otherwise we would have a cycle. But now we have a V structure that wasn't there in step two. For that reason, we know the error goes like that. You see, this is now really tough, and the papers are tough to read on these topics. In particular, proving that this is, these four rules are sufficient, and those are all situations, I imagine that must be really quite tricky. So this is real computer science with graphs and with stuff. Yeah? So it should be a lot of fun to work out. OK, so I think 
we went through these rules and they make sense. The completeness is surprising to me that that's all you need to do, right? But maybe, I mean, maybe one can start with such an example over there for rule four, and then one can show that rule one, two, and three doesn't solve it, right? But there must be a solution to this error, right? On the other hand, maybe you can show that rule four follows from rule two and rule three or something. Maybe one can construct like something like for the do calculus, we could also remove one of the rules. So maybe it's a bit overcomplete as well, uh, possibly. Anyway, okay, so that is the IC algorithm. So far, so good. So far, so messy, right? So this is a very uh, so graph theoretic fiddling around. And some of the papers have lots of text and no pictures. Yeah? And when you look at them, it's hard to read. They are impossible to understand without drawing, drawing images. Yeah? Let's look at the next algorithm, the IC star algorithm. It gets more messy yeah, and more complicated. So be warned. Again, we want to partially recover structures, causal structures, but now we are also having latent structures. So we already partially recovered causal structures where all variables are observable. Next, we want to let also, we allow hidden variables. Why is that something nice to do? Because Typically, when you have a data set, you pick the variables and you put them in your Excel sheet, but you never know whether there are other variables that you just didn't know of and that you didn't observe. So there could be dependencies in data that is not in your Excel sheet, right? Be because of some hidden path or something. And so the IC algorithm is already difficult enough. It's already quite fancy, but it's a bit toy because it's assuming that we observe all variables. More practical is that we don't observe all variables. However, then it's much, much harder. So the problem here is there could be lots of hidden paths that we don't know about. Yeah? So if there's a, a dependence between two nodes, it could be because of a directed edge or because of some hidden confounder. And the hidden confounder can have an arbitrary complicated structure. The approach is as follows. So we want to try, we try to use the IC algorithms that we have already and just jazzing it up a little bit, so making it a little bit more fancy. Um, but before we can do that, we need to find some normal forms of these graphs. So if we have some complicated latent structure in reality in truth, um, we will now show that we can project any complicated latent structure to simpler ones, where we, for example, say there's if there's a dependency between two variables, there's at most one hidden node, yeah, and not 10 hidden nodes. We kind of can combine them into one of them. And so we project them into something simpler and show that the independencies are the same. Yeah, and if we can do such a projection, we have like stronger assumption to work with, okay? So the idea is to project the latent structure, which is about all the unknowns that I cannot observe, onto some normal form where the latent part is minimize as minimal as possible, but where we have exactly the same independencies on the observed variables. Okay, so that is the, the task. And then we generalize our IC algorithm to these normal forms, and it will be a mess nonetheless, okay? So let's first talk about these projections of latent structures. Again, very technical stuff. So we define a latent structure L prime to be the projection of another latent structure L, if and only if, um, let's first move to the first, to the imp important thing. Basically, the independencies should be the same. Yeah? More precisely, for every stable distribution P from our set of Markovian distributions of our latent one, yeah, there must be one from the other, from the projected latent structure, some stable distribution P prime, such that they have the same one. So if I have some stable distributions in one of them, there's also a stable one in the other one with exactly the same independencies. And that is like a very strong link between two graphs, which could be look very different, but then on the observables, they lead to the same independencies. And we, don't, we'll, we won't spell out all the details here. Instead, I will show you the algorithm how to do that, how to get the projection. So now, um, 
if we only had this condition number two, we could just say, okay, a latent structure is the projection of itself, right? However, we wanted to have some normal form, so we kind of should normalize certain ugliness in the L, okay? And that works like this. So every unobservable latent variable in our projection is a parentless common cause of exactly two non-adjacent observable variables. So that means, let me draw a picture. If we have, um, let's say we have three observable variables, x1, x2, x3, and there's one latent variable on top. Let's call it n. And it's influencing all of those. Then this is not a projection of this graph because there's a latent variable which has more than two children. So this can be changed into another situation where I'm having x1, x2, x3, and I need to change I need to add more variables in here. <coughs> so basically I can change it to something like that. And now this fulfills the condition of my projection that every latent variable only has two children. Okay? Of course, here could be other variables on top, right? Whatever. Yeah, the latent stuff could be really complicated, but it is irrelevant for the independencies of my observed variables. So it kind of makes sense that I can remove it. Of course, it could be more complicated like this, right? So I could have something like that as well. Then also in that case, I can collapse it onto some normal form where basically the latent variables are only one level away from the observable ones, okay? But it's not trivial that this is always the case and this can be done. So I'm happy if you think it's plausible that this can be shown, that such a normal form exists. And then there is an algorithm to project something like that on top one. And of course, that is a nice exam question, right? I mean, you get a graph and then you need to derive that one. Yeah, so that's something that you will also practice in the exercises. Okay. Um, so let's again look at the definition. So in the projection, every unobservable variable, so the latent variables, is a parentless, so there is nothing coming in to this one, common cause of exactly two observable variables. And here's one more detail. Those two variables are even non-adjacent, so they don't have a direct connection. If they would have a direct connection, I can also omit the latent variable, right? Then it's not relevant. If there's any way direction, then I can include it, the effect into the edge between them. Okay, so to describe the projection algorithm, we need more notions. Yeah, notions are always interesting, right? So they, let, they extend our language to formulate something very powerful. So we need the following things. We need to define what a latent path is, okay? A latent path, intuitively, it's kind of clear, right? It's a path between two variables that goes through latent, through the latent variables, and that's exactly what it is. Um, so it's a path between those two variables where all other nodes along the path are unobservable. That's a latent path. That's a very natural definition. However, there's one subtlety. Suppose there's a direct edge from A to B, then such a direct edge is also a latent path, right? Because all variables along the path are unobservable, and the set of variables along the path is empty. So they are all unobservable. So this is also a latent path, which sounds a bit pathological because latent path sounds a little bit like it should go through this part of the graph which is like unobservable and this edge here is inside the observable variable. However, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because there might be a causal chain between two random variables that go from A to C to D to E to F to B, but you only observe A and B because that's what you're measuring. You're not measuring the other stuff. And you see there's a dependence and there's also a causal connection so it kind of makes sense to draw a direct error from A to B. So basically an error among the observable variables is kind of maybe an implementation of something that goes through many other steps in between. 
Okay, but that's very important. A latent pass could be a directed edge directly between observables. And then there's a notion of a divergent pass, and that's also kind of clear what it is. From A to B, it's a pass that looks like this or like that, right? So there's one node in between, and then there are arrows going to A and arrows going to B, okay? And the divergent paths are, of course, examples like on the board from N1 to X1 and X2, that's a divergent path, for example. And of course, there could be also a latent divergent path. So you could also combine these two notions. So let's look at the definition. It's a path that has no collider, right? So no node where the edges go like that, yeah? And there's exactly one divergent node. I guess there must be one divergent node um, where then there are directions going from one to the other. I guess A to A, A, A arrow B is also a divergent path, yeah? I think, but since the set along the path of other edges, uh, of other nodes is empty, ah, okay, exactly one now, maybe that's not a divergent path, okay? So maybe A arrow B is not a divergent path, okay? It doesn't make sense. Okay, let's look at the algorithm. Now we have the notions to, to do this. So the input is a latent structure, the output is a projection, okay, which is another latent structure. First of all, the projection has the same observables, fine, right? That kind of makes sense, since we are talking about the independencies between these sets of observable nodes, it's kind of reasonable. Um, and now, initially we don't have any latent variables in our projection, and then we need to introduce some of them by looking at our latent structure F. In, initially, we also don't have any edges, we not even have edges between the nodes in the observables, okay? We don't have any of them. Now, if there is a latent directed path from observable A to an observable B, yeah? So if there's a path going through latent variables, a directed path that is really going only one direction, in that case, we draw directly an edge between A and B, right? So that's like containing the same information. A is causing B. Whether it's with some intermediate steps, that doesn't matter. Yeah. And then the other thing is, if there's a latent divergent path from A to B, in that case, we add some latent, a new latent variable called UAB yeah, to our set of nodes, and these edges uh, from A to U, uh, from U to A, and from U to B, okay? And that's it. <coughs> and now you might ask, so where do we get the usual edges there if there's no latent directed path from A to B? How do I get an edge from A to C? which was in L, how do I get it in L prime? Do you have an idea how to get those directed edges that are among the observables in L? Which step does generate those? Of course, I'm starting here with the empty set. So it's one of the puzzles that I'm thinking every year when I give this lecture again. So maybe I should put a slide. I put it on the slide. Um, so we initialize with the empty set. That's exactly like Verma in 1993 did it in his paper. Um, the point is non-latent edges, so edges, directed edges among the observables are latent paths, as I discussed on the previous slide. So these directed are latent paths. So that means if I have a latent directed path from A to B, it could be also a directed edge from A to B. And so then I add it. So the step four will just add all of those. Okay. Okay, so that's just an algorithm. And it's then some more sophisticated proof to prove that this projection algorithm fulfills this other condition that the independencies on the observable variables are the same. Question? No, I don't understand step five. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. Diversion means that there is a path. Uh, di ah, okay, let me see. What's the word does it say? So there's not a direct edge from A to B necessarily. So it can go over many stations, but it should be a diversion path. So it's some, some way along the path, it skips to another path. Yeah, so there is some other node from which the arrows go outward to A and to B. And this whole part could be in the latent space. 
So, um, but let's look at our example again. Mm. So, um, so in this case, so there's some one latent pass between x1 and x2, and one latent divergent pass. That's why we get the n. And maybe we should call it um, n1, or it, it was called u12, and then this is u13, and this is u23. And there's also a latent divergent pass from x1 to x3, also via this node, but there's also another one over there. So um, even if we if we would have if that would be the, the true structure, right? There is one latent divergent pass from n to both of these. For that reason, we introduce this u13, and then there's also one from two and three again via the n. Okay. So that's basically how it works. So you look at the graph. I think basically you copy all the edges that you have already here between them. You copy them down. And then you need to look at the divergent paths, the latent divergent paths, and for those you need to introduce these nodes. Yeah. So it, I'm not proving that now the independencies of these ones are the same as the independencies of that one. But it is kind of reasonable, so again a little bit hand wavy. So if there are like direct dependencies, they are kind of covered. And if there's something in the latent space, some relationship between nodes, then it doesn't matter how complicated it is, right? It does the exact structure up here in the latent space doesn't matter. It's only a matter whether two things are linked or not. And if they are linked, I can introduce one of these variables here. And then this is kind of like a normal form for a large class of, of graphs which have the same independent structures. But this is all kind of non-trivial these things are now the same, yeah. Okay, so far so good? Okay. Um, so, then there's a theorem that says the projection algorithm works. Oh, I can't see it. So the output of the projection is the, the output of the algorithm is the projection of the input latent structure. And it's, you can look at the paper to, to get a feeling for it if you, if you really like. I'm just presenting it here as a result, so we are not going into detail. I think it would, uh, we go over time anyway a little bit, so okay. And it's too complicated. I also never looked at it yet, so it might be interesting to work out. Okay, so let's get to the IC algorithm. I first show you the IC algorithm. So here's the IC algorithm. It's very similar. In the first step, we create an undirected graph with these sets, blah, 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 exactly as before. In the next one, we are orienting these A, C, B things, if we can, if there's a V structure. And then the last, last thing, we are orienting as many edges as possible. However, there's this thing about arrowheads suddenly and marks. So it uses even a more weird notation with double arrows and with arrows with a star. And it took me quite a while to understand what this is all about. So hopefully I can explain it to you. So we need now the so-called marked pattern. And that's a certain type of graph which has, which has four types of edges. Yeah? So it gets really messy. So Either I'm just having an undirected edge, so that's like in the PDAX, that's the old thing, okay? However, the meaning of such an undirected edge is threefold. So it could mean there's a, a, a B causes A or A causes B, as before. However, it could also mean that there is some latent variable which is causing both. So the first thing is like an instance of Reichenbach's principle in, in, in a way, okay? And now, the, the edge is my starting point. The undirected edge is in the algorithm always the starting point. It's the skeleton that I get from step one. And now I'm not orienting edges, I'm adding error heads. Okay? And adding error heads means I can add an error head on the right hand side and then after that also on the left hand side. Yeah? And so there are different possibilities. I could have just an edge, an oriented edge, I could have an oriented edge that has both error heads, 
and I can have an oriented edge with one arrowhead that also has a star on top of it. And basically, these three versions, they kind of restrict the possibilities that are left. So if there's an edge, it could be one direction, the other direction, or some latent variable, basically. If I draw an arrowhead on this side, it means it could be either one direction or some common confounder, but it's not possible anymore that it's a, uh, a arrowhead on the left-hand side B. Okay, so by putting an arrowhead on the right-hand side, I'm excluding one of the cases. I'm basically excluding this one. Okay. And curiously, if I add then additionally another arrowhead here, yeah, then I'm excluding also the case A error B. So maybe it gets more, more be better by drawing something on the board. So basically, there's like a taxonomy. So the starting point is no edge. OK, that's the first possibility. And then there's, I can, I don't know how to, so this is a different type of error now. I can have this type of edge, OK? And once I have that type of edge, I can go different different way. I could orient it by putting an arrowhead like that, or I can orient it by putting the arrowhead the other way around. But then I could also um, put the arrowhead the other way around as well afterwards. Yeah, so starting from here, getting the skeleton, I make a connection. And then in certain situation, I put an arrowhead on the right-hand side. In certain situation, I put an arrowhead on the left-hand side. And maybe I'm done, or maybe not. And then after doing that one, I might put an arrowhead on both sides. And there's yet another possibility. I can also put a star on top of this one, OK? So this is basically what's happening during the algorithm. And they have different meanings. So let's start from the bottom. So that means, um, in our usual world, the graph looks like that. Yeah. So this is now the causal graph. And this is the, uh, what was it called? Mark pattern notation. OK, the other way around, of course, is the other way around. So arrowhead on one side and a star, only one possibility, only one possibility. And having the double error, there's only one possibility. There must be some latent node. OK, those are the bottom three cases. There's only one possibility left. Let's look at this, the next level here, this one. Uh, let's first take the other one. So that one is either I'm having A error B or I'm having A U B. OK, so basically if I'm seeing this pattern, I don't know yet whether I will end up with this one or with that one. And possibly the algorithm stops. And then all I can say, OK, it's either that one or that one. So this mark pattern is a possible way to be an even more general partial dike. So the partial dike was something where I have an edges, and then I have those two possibilities. But now I'm having additional possibilities that there might be also some common ones. And along the way, I can stop at any point. So this one, that one. Then there's also the other way around which is just the other way around, or a common cause. And then sometimes if I end up with the IC star algorithm with something like that, then I just don't know whether I have this or that. So basically both is possible. 
Okay, did I miss anything? Okay, there's also the edge. And that means I'm having A error B or B error A or A error U error B. Okay, so that's the, that is this mark pattern notation. So far so good, it's the same as on the slide. So this notation is chosen such that IC star is very much an extension of the IC algorithm. So that's the motivation for it, but it's very technical, right? Um, okay, as I said, the first two steps are almost identical and the third step has the same intention. And you can't see anything, okay? So, also, I like the notation, it's not from me, but from them, but it's a nice idea because starting with an undirected edge, we still have three possibilities, and then by adding error heads and stars, kind of we're restricting the possibilities that are left in the graph. Okay, so here's the algorithm. The input is a set of independent statements, the output is a marked pattern. Again, a marked pattern is this type of graph with these four different types of edges. So, first step is the same as before. We draw an undirected edge, the second step is already looking more complicated. So suppose I'm having non-adjacent nodes A and B as before, there must be a set SAB. If they have a common neighbor like this, I need to check whether C is in A and B. If it's not, then now I have to create a V structure by adding error heads, pointing from A to C and B to C. So I'm putting little error heads on the right, so next to the C basically, yeah? And it can happen that I already had put an error head right next to A. And so now that means that I got a double error head, which means there must be a common cause causing both of them, okay? So the second step looks very much like before, but now instead of really orienting the edges, I can only add the error heads. And I cannot for sure say whether the direction is there because of a common cause or whether there's really direction. And then in the third step, I'm following two routes to add more error heads or a mark. So I can avoid further V structures. And I do this by replacing one of the edges by a definite directed edge. So that was the one with the star, where I definitely say it will be C error B at the end. Yeah. In case if there is a node A that is also pointing to C, yeah. <coughs> or if there's a double error or the other way around. And this is now a bit subtle, which I'm always struggling with, because if I have A error C, it could be that there is a common cause, right? And I'm not sure about the independencies here, whether that's really definitely the case that I need to orient the edge or not. It's only in one of the cases where this leads to a V structure, right? So I'm a bit unclear about this 3.1. Right? Because is it really necessary? Is it really for sure that I can do this? Only maybe because the A, for example, this one, yeah, I'm not sure whether the, 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 the V structure is really a problem here or not. So I'm a bit unclear about this 3.1. And then there's the option to add error heads to the edges between A and B. So an error head at B. If we have a directed path from A to B, where we have already stars on top of it. So we know definitely there is a directed chain from A to B. So in that case, I know um, there must be, a, or basically by putting an error head from, um, if you have something like this, and I put an error head like that, basically what it's doing is it's excluding the case that, so it's excluding one of the three cases down here, right? So here are three things possible, and by putting an error head on this side, I'm excluding one of the two of the three possibilities. Because I know if that would be the right one, then I get a cycle. Yeah. Okay, maybe similar reasoning could be applied to 3.1, but I, I wasn't able to do it yet. So maybe I, it requires further thinking. Okay, we are already slightly over time, sorry, but we are also almost done. So this is an example from Perl, which I, I haven't worked out, but so suppose this is a true underlying graphical structure, okay? Then after step one, you get the right skeleton. And after step two, you get some V structure here. But note, this edge means 
that there could be also a latent variable between B and D, because this is not the usual partially DAG, but it's a marked pattern, okay? And then at the end, I can also orient the one down here with similar reasoning to avoid additional V structures. I get a definite thing down here. However, note, this is the output of the algorithm IC star, and those are possible latent structures, yeah, which are equivalent to this one. Yeah, for example, I could have like a double error between B and D, so there could be a latent variable between B and D and generating these errors, and also between D and C, and also at all other locations here that I haven't specifically marked. The only thing that I really learned here was that D is the cause of E. Okay, I learned that from my observations here. So some of the edges are definitely oriented and of some of them, I just don't know, okay? Um, there's some subtlety how to create a double error at all. And that's something where you, so one thing is you could create a, dub, a double error in, in case number two. So that's one possibility, yeah? So it can happen that there is already an, an error ahead from A to C and then suddenly you get another one. And in 3.2, three two, it can also ha add, uh, happening because you just add an error head here. You're not adding like a star and an error head or something, just an error head. So that's another possibility where you could also get a double head. The double head is interesting because it tells us there must be some latent variable, right? So that's kind of interesting that we can infer that. It's fast from my limited understanding, there must be one. I might be wrong about that one. So you see, each of these little symbolic things here requires quite a bit of thinking, so it's quite a tough topic in my opinion, but I think it, it's quite interesting and a nice connection to computer science. Um, so here's an example that generates an, um, a double arrow, okay, and I leave it now as an exercise here, but it should be doable by going through the algorithm. If you want to spend the time, we can try it together. Do you want to see it together? Do you still have time or do you have something at four o'clock? You have to go. You want to see it? Yeah? Okay, I can do it. So feel free to go. Um, let me just copy it. And if I can't do it, I will take it out of the video. And um, so let's, um, I think I copied it right. Let's start with the IC algorithm. Let's start with the undirected graph. So basically we always draw, those are the ones, the edges that I'm omitting. And I'm drawing all the other edges, okay? So basically I'm having, yeah, bye bye. A, um, So I'm having all edges but from B to C and from A to D. Okay, so let's draw it maybe like this. Okay, so that is the skeleton, right? Only where I'm having like a separating set here, I don't draw edges and I draw all the other edges because otherwise there should be some independence. So that is step one, fine. And now I need to go through the non-adjacent edges, which is BC and AD, and I need to check um, whether I'm having a structure with, um, okay, we have it here on the, on, the, on the thing. So let's start with B and C, okay? So let's talk about BC, and I'm looking at a common neighbor. So one common neighbor would be B, A, C. And I need to check whether the A is in the separating set. And it is. If it is in the separating set, I do nothing. Okay? However, there's another one, a common neighbor, D, which is um, not in the separating set. So now I can draw error heads towards it, like this, okay? So that was my first BC discussion. Let's take the other one, AD. So, um, 
So I'm having A, I can put something in between, to D, and I can put the B in between. So the B is not in my separating set. Okay, so now I can add some edges towards the B. And then I can also put the C in there, but the C is in my separating set, so I don't put anything else. And I think this is already the example where I'm getting a double head error, okay? However, let's go through the other points too. To avoid further V structures, yeah, we could replace one of the undirected edges, there's only one of them, yeah, with a definite direction. If there is such a node, okay, let's try to understand that one. So we could replace AC possibly with an error um, if there is a node that either A to C or A blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, do we have it? No. Basically, it says um, C and B, if there's another node that points towards C, or with a double error towards C, or with a definite edge towards C, in that case, we can do something, and vice versa for B if we change the rows of B and C. However, A and C, in this case, both have no error heads here or here. Okay, so the case 3.1 is not triggered. Yeah? So 3.1 is done. Um, let's look at 3.2. In 3.2, basically, if there is a directed path where we are already sure about the outcome, but we don't have anything with the star in here. So we are also done with 3.2. So this is the mark pattern for this input, okay? And now what does it mean? What kind of, so this is the mark pattern. Mark pattern. Um, let's draw a causal structure that is compatible with that one. And that would be, for example, A, error, B. Uh, here must be a latent variable. I think there must be a latent variable. Is it true? Yeah, according to this one. So this is a possible graph. Another one would be the other way around. Another one would be here, double error. So it's all possible if, if it's just an edge. If I have an edge like that, it could, if I have an edge like that, it could be also a double error, but it cannot be this one, that's not possible, but it must be one that has an error head over here, but it could be a double error, which is then again corresponding to yet another latent variable. And this could be, for example, like this. So many possibilities. So we get some information, but nothing definite. So we excluded some of the cases, right? We know, for example, there cannot be, B cannot be the cause of A, but we don't know whether A is the cause of B. There could be a common cause. And down here we know neither A nor B is the, is the cause, right? There is a latent variable for that one. Okay, so that's how it works. Okay, so far so good. This is the end of the lecture. Yeah, there's some Nice list of algorithms if you are interested in implementation. So there are also Python implementations for all of these ones. Could be fun to look at. And that's it for today. Okay, so thanks for your extended attention and I see you next week.